very much. Um, really great to be here. My name is Dan Meyer. I have taught high school math for six years, currently in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, I've gone part-time at my school this year, teaching only two classes, and I will be starting a job developing curriculum with Google on Monday. So that's kind of my background. I'm um, really excited to be here. Please definitely make use of the chat box. Uh, the more feedback and criticism I get on this, the more valuable it will be for me. Um, Let's clarify the title real fast here, uh, just so there's no, no false expectations. I'd like to address and solve two huge problems with math education. I'm sure there's many more. Uh, one involves pedagogy, which is how we teach, and one involves curriculum, which is what we teach. Uh, this will be a very pragmatic talk. We're not going to address NCLB or standardized testing or charter schools or unionization. Those are essential debates, but I have a very hard time finding traction on any of those hills. Uh, I'm really interested in scalable solutions, cheap solutions, uh, solutions that will skate right past those very politicized issues and eat the lunch right out of uh, our elected officials' hands. Okay? Um, hopefully we're all still here. This guy right here is David Milch on the right, and he kind of brings up what is, I think, a, a huge problem affecting uh, the world and one that I have a direct part in. He's an incredible TV producer and writer. Been making incredible TV for decades, uh, namely Deadwood recently. Um, at, at MIT's Great Writers series, he summed up everything I do poorly as a teacher. I'll read. There is a different drama which is enacting itself in our country right now, and it has to do with a failure to acknowledge the necessary moral and imaginative predicate that has become an entirely virtual existence, which is people spend more than half their waking hours watching television. Just think about that for a second that has to shape the neural pathways. It creates an impatience, for example, with irresolution. And I'm doing what I can to tell stories which engage those issues in ways which can engage the imagination so that people don't feel threatened by it. And this is right before he makes a vow to not produce any more contemporary TV dramas. Because this guy sees exactly what kind of damage he does to people's impatience with irresolution. My students are impatient with irresolution. They're impatient with problems uh, that don't resolve nicely, that don't conform to a recipe they've already learned. Uh, they're impatient with problems that don't offer easy confirmation of correctness or incorrectness. And this horrifies me. It should horrify you. None of my students will graduate like this and solve any of the big problems facing the world. They want easy answers, and none of those answers are easy. Uh, here's, here's one sorry part I play in this transaction. For example, I have students who can engage me in mathematical conversation, seem totally confident just by reading my facial expression. Uh, for example, uh, they'll just watch, and if I respond to their answer with the face on the left, they'll make sure to act confident in their response. Uh, the one on the right, they'll act like they realize an error and try a different answer and repeat that process until they, they hit the one they're looking for. So once I realize that, I train myself to respond with just this face right here, regardless of the answer, which is painful, because what teacher isn't excited by their student's correctness? But I had to make myself less excited about the answer and more excited about the justification for the answer. Another example. Uh, here's one for the crowd. Uh, let's see where you're coming from mathematically. If I stack uh, two cups inside each other, 2A and 2B, which stack will be taller, A or B? I'm looking for uh, the chat box right now. I got Brian. A, A, B. Looking for a few more here. Again, we're stacking them inside of each other. So two A's and two B's right inside. Definitely have a look at the responses there. Brian is going to be dead wrong. Fix his tongue out. Picking him out of the chat right now. Let's see here. Yeah, uh, majority say B. All right, fine. So let's talk about stacking 100 cups up. Stack 100 cups inside each other. Which will be taller, A or B? Please answer again. Right, right. You guys kind of, kind of get what's going on here. Now, now tell me this. In the chat box, what is the next question? Yeah, so, so why is it, why is a huge question here? Why is a huge question? But even, even more than that, my, my students at this point 
uh, Andy Smith nails it there in the, in the, in the comments, like how many cups until both stacks will be, will be the same height? If, if, uh, if A is taller, let me see if I'll get this wrong here. Yeah, if A is taller at 100 and B is taller at 2, at some point in there, uh, we hop the tracks. And so asking kind of that, that meta level, learning about learning questions, those kind of questions did not come easy to me my first five years teaching at all. Um, and gradually I come to, come to ask those. Learning about learning is valuable. Um, other students, uh, other habits that, that make my students patient with irresolution, when I'm talking with them individually, I, I respond to every answer with, right, why? Uh, it makes students less defensive and more open with their thought process when I, I just kind of give a, a confirmation of their answer and, and then ask them why, rather than saying, uh, no, uh, that isn't it. What's your work on that? That sort of response tends to, tends to close them up. And, and really, I don't care about their answer as much as I do about that thought process. That process is precious to me now. Um, or, or recently, I'll, I'll ask students to give me a wrong answer. If a student is struggling with a problem, rather than hinge the entire activity on the correctness of the answer, Let's talk about incorrect answers. For example, if I ask you how tall is the Eiffel Tower in meters, that's difficult. But if I ask you how tall isn't the Eiffel Tower in meters, that's much easier uh, and it's also valuable because it establishes a range around the answer and gets us thinking about uh, the answer from a different perspective. In some, in some here, I'm trying to be less helpful. I've been too helpful in all the wrong ways. I've turned out students who crave resolution to familiar problems. I'm, I'm working on that. That's the pedagogy side. That's, that's how I teach uh, in a way that's destructive and, and not destructive. Can we talk now about curriculum that lets us down? Uh, it would be easier to talk here about drill and kill style problems, uh, but my heart just isn't really in it. I think skill practice is a necessary part of a well-balanced diet. Uh, you'll never hear me claim otherwise. There are larger problems here. Uh, the biggest problem facing math curriculum that I have used is how do we get students thinking about mathematical reasoning in the world around them? Uh, I'll submit to you that this is not it. You have a, a potentially interesting application of slope here, a ski lift. Some parts of the lift are steeper than others. But what curriculum, traditional curriculum, tends to do here is apply a mathematical framework immediately before the student has even wondered out loud, what about this is interesting to me? This is a, a huge mathematical spoiler. The end of the movie has been given away here. You have the grid, the points are labeled, the axes are labeled, uh, the interesting questions are broken down into four parts. It even spells out the definition of, of slope in the steps below, uh, which is a uh, which is a question that's fun for uh, to talk about with students, talking about like what makes something steep, where they have to consider. Students will often, uh, they'll often, you know, assume it's just about a vertical change. Like if something's going up high, that means it's very steep, and you can kind of confound that definition in some fun ways. And by talking about the inputs like that, uh, we get a, a very strong idea of what uh, what slope is and where it is around us. Uh, this textbook problem, again, I submit to you does the exact opposite of that by spoon feeding the answers and uh, applying a mathematical framework immediately to the problem. Uh, this right here, yeah, wow, well, I, I get such a sad, a sad vibe from this right here. Um, I almost don't know what to say about it. Clearly, the, the author is very well intentioned, um, looking to, to set the students up to consider where they see projectile motion um, in the real world. But, I mean, just check out the contrivance here. You have, like, what, what volleyball uh, player knows the equation of their volleyball? You know, it's a total contrivance. And moreover, you have taken away from the student the process of considering the inputs. Like, what matters for the ball going over the net? Well, it's the height of the net, and it's the distance from uh, the, the, the volleyball player to the net. But not only are, are both of those already defined, but they're drawn onto the problem. Uh, there, there's, there's very little for the student to do here except for plug in numbers and interpret the answer. Um, and it's just sad because there's, there's definitely some interesting stuff here. But I don't know if there's a, a meaningful conversation to be had with the student about this problem. Uh, here's, a, here's a physics sample problem. 
already worked out. Uh, you, I have no problem with this. Um, it, it emphasizes kind of the variables and what you plug in and what's, what the unknowns are and uh, how you solve for the unknowns. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but then you get into the actual problems themselves in this, in this, you know, this is a large textbook with a lot of reach. And you have this right here. You see how it refers you at the bottom there to the sample problem it came from. And so all that's left is to, to figure out those three numbers there. Where do they go into the formula? And how do you solve for the unknowns? This right here, I hope you can see this is how we, how we get students to crave resolution of problems, quick resolutions. Uh, we get them to care about the answers and not the process. Uh, you can see how this is not helping them solve anything uh, worth solving later on in life. At least that's how I see it. Uh, so now let's talk about the solution here. The solution to the curriculum problem. Um, we're going to take it from two, two different angles here. here. Here's something that I love, absolutely love. It's called the Muji Crow Notebook. Um, it's, it's a day planner, but it's a very light, loose framework applied to the traditional day planner. I've never been able to use one traditionally because it has such a tight structure comprising calendars and hour rows. Um, it's perfect for a specific kind of person. But Muji says here, here is the least structure we could get away with, a clock in the center of the page. Now you create the rest. It forces you to consider, what is a day planner to me? Uh, you can. You can add events. You can write notes. Um, this is the least uh, possible framework they could have applied here, which is pretty great. And there's a lesson there for teachers. Also, um, no presentation I give would be complete without uh, a perfunctory wire reference. Um, this right here. Uh, I'd ask you, which of these is the bad guy or bad guys? If you've seen it, you know it's tough to tell, uh, tough to tell that. Because for one reason, in the wire, they only use what's called diegetic music, which is a fancy word meaning they only use music that occurs naturally in the scene. This means you don't have any ominous or heroic musical cues to announce the heroes and villains, which means you need to construct that meaning from smaller, more meaningful clues. Um, the wire, it is said by some critics, uh, has to teach you to watch it, how to watch it. Um, all of that leads me to this right here. This right here is my love for teaching math. This is how I make patient learners, uh, by being less helpful. There's no math here. We haven't applied a framework. There's no diagrams drawn on. There's no information given. Nothing but a conversation uh, waiting to happen. So how the dialogue goes here with students is kind of like this. We'll just talk about it. And students at this point are so used to this overly mathematics that they won't even know we're about to do some serious math. Um, for example, I'll ask, what do you see here? Someone will say a tennis ball. And we'll talk about why the tennis ball looks like that. Is it a kind that happens to be come out of the out of the can blurred? No. Some student will uh, express his knowledge about about shutter speeds. How uh, you, you press the shutter and uh, on camera. It goes click, and then light comes in, and it goes click again. And I'll ask them, okay, so was the shutter open for like well, five seconds here or what? And they'll say, no way. Uh, a fraction of a second, they'll say. And some of my students are so savvy that they know where to find that information, the shutter speed. So I'll ask them, where do you find it? And they'll say, uh, they won't say the exit data, but they'll say something like uh, on, the, on the side panel in an iPhoto. And then I'll put this up. So you see what we're doing here is we're slowly, ever so slowly, lowering down a mathematical framework on this problem only as you can sort of give me permission to do it. Um, in any case, we certainly don't start with that information already on there. Um, I ask them, so what does that mean, uh, 25, 25 seconds, 25 milliseconds? And we'll say, no, 1 25th of a second. And I'll say, okay, so what, what can we ask about this? And um, if it doesn't come out, I might bring it up. I, I'd be curious, like, how high... How high uh, was this ball when it was dropped? Or how fast is it going right now is another question, depending on, on the age of your audience there. And from there, we can talk about the inputs. What, what the textbook usually gives us are the crucial inputs. And here, they're not given. We have to talk about them. What matters is shutter speed. What matters is how far the ball has traveled in that 1 25th of a second. And at that point, I layer on the last piece of the framework, which is a meter stick. I just got to leave that right there for a second. Um, so this, this again, um, this is how this is how I teach now as often as possible, 
is, uh, is by slowly lowering down a framework on top of a problem um, and then having a conversation about it. Uh, the, these problems, I, mean, I, I encourage you to think about how, how would a, a textbook approach this problem? How would a textbook, a traditional one, uh, ruin this problem? Think about that for a second here. So we have that right there. That's, that's how I imagine a textbook taking this one apart um, and making it much less fun. So this is as concise a model of, uh, of curriculum development as I could come up with um, you know, for this, these purposes here. Uh, a five-stepper, uh, it builds from multimedia, and multimedia which is extremely cheap to create with cheap software and cheap hardware. Um, and it asks a concise question, like how fast or how far. Um, or how high. Also, it encourages intuition, meaning that uh, I can ask the student, well, how high do you think that ball has dropped right there? And the student can say, uh, I think three meters. It's a very low-risk guess, and it generates buy-in from students who perhaps don't, don't usually want to contribute to those conversations. Their guess is as good as mine. We can talk about good reasoning, bad reasoning, ask the question, what would, what would, a, what would a bad answer be here? Uh, but it encourages students' intuition. Um, and the trickier part here is that these problems have to scale in difficulty and they have to iterate, which means I need to show up with more than just that one tennis ball picture. I need to show up with other tennis ball pictures with longer blurs or shorter blurs, whether it start higher up. I need to ask the question, what would a, a ball that was dropped from a mile up in the air, what would that blur look like? Um, on the subject of iteration, here's another example here. Um, I should apologize to my blog readers. This is not new to them. Um, apologies. Anyway, uh, what, what are good questions we could ask here of the students? I find this lock key very fascinating. I took a, a photo of it. That's all. Um, students might ask, what's the combination? Or um, how many possibilities are there? And we could, we could talk about, well, would you, if you're the lock maker, would you want there to be four number possibilities, or five numbers, or three numbers, or ten numbers? Like, what's the trade-off here? Ten numbers is, is obviously more secure, but what's the trade-off? So we're having this conversation about an image that has no math drawn onto it yet. We research, we find out that uh, this lock maker has a, has a four number combination. And that's when I drop uh, the night vision goggles on, or the infrared goggles on, and we have a look at fingerprints. So if this is the fingerprint uh, display here, and there's four numbers, we can talk about, all right, what's, what's the combination? I thought there was four numbers. Uh, for the combination, but we only have one up here. We're starting from a very simple uh, standpoint, very simple uh, framework here, and, and gradually making it much, much harder. Moving up to, to four numbers or, um, you know, all sorts of different combinations there. That's, that's the iteration I'm talking about. It's not enough to show up with one interesting image. You've got to come bringing more than that. But again, these are all very cheap to create. Or, for example, here on the subject of iteration and scaling and difficulty, uh, you have uh, the last card of the last hand of last year's World Series of Poker. One of these two guys is going to walk away with a lot of money. And so if a student is into, is, uh, into poker but not into math, I can, I can pull this one out and say, all right, well, um, how many cards out of the remaining deck will help uh, Demidoff and how many will help Eastgate? And you'll notice that I have uh, I've blacked out what the what ESPN usually does there by providing the computer generated probabilities, which then means we can confirm the student's answer and talk about uh, possible sources of error. And then we can make it harder by, for example, going back one card, and now all of a sudden there's there's many many more uh, combinations here uh, to consider, or or we can drop it all the way back to um, what they got on the on the deal and work those probabilities. Either way, we can scale this in difficulty until it challenges the learner uh, sufficiently. The last part I'd love to talk about of this ideal, ideal curriculum, my ideal curriculum, is that, uh, man, this stuff is contagious. Um, for example, here's one recently, okay? Uh, I posted this one. This is a, a supermarket, supermarket lanes right here. On the right side, you have uh, the express lane. Uh, four carts with very few items. On the right side, you have one person with 19 items. This is not a trick question. I need you to tell me in the chat box, uh, left side or right side, which would you pick?
Yeah, some of you guys saw the back of the book on this one. So yeah, so, so Brian again is uh, being that kid in the back of the classroom, saying it depends on the checkout speed of the cashier. Man, it depends on a lot more than that. There are a lot of things that could go wrong, but all things being equal except for um, items in the cart and number of carts, let's talk about it. Which would you go for? Um, so anyway, yeah, a lot of folks say right, and um, so, I mean, I went out and actually uh, counted for 90 minutes. I counted the number of items people paid for, how long it took them. I went to a local grocery store um, and kind of worked around like a creeper, um, taking notes, came up with this graph. Uh, it's linear. Um, those numbers, those parameters on the equation are very important. Um, the grocery store manager was kind enough. I don't think he, he thought this information would be going on to a O'Reilly presentation, um, but there it is. This is interesting information and kind of gives away uh, what is the crucial uh, fact in my eyes that um, every time that person's aligned, you're adding 48 extra seconds. That's tender time added to other time. Um, before you even thought about the item in their cart. Meanwhile, an extra item only costs you uh, an extra 2.8 seconds. That's the 21.28 items per minute. So you'd rather add 17 more items to the line than one extra person, um, which, which to me says a lot about my experience with express lanes not being uh, a good use of my time. So anyway, what I'm saying here is, is this, this question here, which lane would you choose, is again, it's concise. You can guess at it. It encourages intuition. It taps into your experience of, of shopping, which everyone has, um, and we have confirmation of answers. And I, I mean, I was just surprised at how, how fast this thing took off um, across across the internet. Um, Andrew Sullivan grabbed it. Financial Times, New York Times, um, uh, newspapers in languages I can't read, um, but who knows what they're saying? Kaki. Um, I was on on the local news. Um, embarrassing. Consumerist and life hacker most recently, and this this to me is confirmation. You know, not of any sort of uh, this is not personal pride here. It's confirmation to me of of what happens when you when you frame these questions, you know, visually, uh, concisely, and you you make multimedia um, available to people. So this is this is uh, this is not the ideal curriculum, but it's ideal in the sense that this this stuff is cheap. Um, it was very cheap to make. It was cheap to distribute using the internet. It leverages broadband capability and social networking tools. Um, so, so it's time to start putting this into play. Uh, but I'm building with a developer uh, the website BeLessHelpful.com, which is um, you know either the worst website for an educational tool that I've ever heard of or the best. I really don't know yet. Uh, which this this is not the iPod. This is not that killer app or tool that everyone has always wanted. This is an app I believe um, that a lot of math teachers don't yet know they want. They don't know how much more satisfying this kind of teaching and learning is. They don't know how much how much better um, students respond to this kind of uh, invested process. This site, I think, will see a slow burn, but it's so cheap and so fun. Um, and if we put a, if we help put a few hidebound textbook publishers out of business, you know, I won't shed a tear because the stakes are just too high. So that's what I got. Those are the two big problems. Um, I'd love to open this up to questions and answers um, if anybody's got anything to talk about. Hey, great. great. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. All right. All right. Here. I hear a slight I echo. Hear slight echo. Or... Do other people hear that? I don't know. Okay, good. Good. Just want to make sure. Um, so, uh, one person, Jeff, is asking, isn't the textbook just a starting point to get conversations started in the classroom? Yeah, good question. I mean, in most cases, I'll come across a problem like the volleyball problem, and I'll have to reverse engineer it um, from kind of this highly controlled, highly specific um, structure that they've, they've already imposed on it, reverse engineer that, and then build kind of uh, my own multimedia problem out of it. So there's, there's some very valuable thought in textbooks. There's also very valuable skill practice in textbooks. Um, but by and large, I think they, they approach it from not just the, the, the reverse from my perspective, uh, the reverse standpoint from mine, but also a harmful one um, for student thought processes. And uh, Luke just had an interesting comment. He said he noticed that calculus and other math books from the 50s are small and light, whereas today they're quite large and heavy. Um, and he says, presumably, calculus hasn't changed, but um, 
Do you have insight into that? I, I don't, yeah. I think I, I, I know the textbooks that Luke is talking about, and I, I do think that um, Rich's, com Rich's comment next, um, that the textbook perhaps does too much for the students, it, is apt, where um, it, what might have been just one question with many access points in the past, now is that those access points are reduced down to one, and that one access point is spelled out in um, steps A, B, C, and D, which adds length. Okay, and you probably saw Brian's uh, question. He just asked, uh, have you ever incorporated media into your assessments o along the lines of a listening component to a world language test or I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I see that there. I I haven't. I mean, I'm not sure. I have to think about it. I do, I do just want to assess students' facility uh, and fluency with math and not, you know, their ability to take these kind of photos that I'm taking. I see that that is my job as a teacher to structure these photos in a, in a helpful way. Okay, and then, um, hold on. So uh, Annie was asking, what age is the supermarket checkout question suitable for? Right, I think we'd all agree it depends. I, I mean, there's some, <laughs> some, there's some, uh, some ages, of, uh, you, you really have to have some kind of reference point for the grocery shopping experience. So if students don't have a, a visual to connection, connection to the boredom of waiting in the wrong line or watching another line uh, move faster than yours, I don't think it will be, will be useful. In terms of the math, however, um, I've seen some interesting work already with this exact problem with some sixth graders um, and fleshing out the difference between the average time per item and then adding in this extra transaction time. Um, so that's my only reference point there. Okay. And then uh, Brian was asking, uh, how do you uh, how do you tend to handle the kids who say it depends for the the supermarket checkout question on things like the speed of the cashier and and other um, other variables? Sure. Yeah, I think Brian is asking that from uh, from personal interest. Also, it seems like uh, it, yeah, it, I, I think it's great. I think when I when I taught with the textbook where the, the method is very prescribed. I felt much more flummoxed and kind of frustrated with that student. But when we have this kind of open, um, this, this very lightly structured process, those sort of kids in the back of the class are like literally like a light switch, fun, fun to have around. Uh, they're essential to have around. And eventually we might say, okay, let's just limit this process just to items in the cart and how many carts there are. But um, wow, we need those kids to be able to talk about all the different loose inputs that are complicating this problem. Like any, any curriculum that does not um, embrace those kids doesn't realize what they're losing later on in life in terms of, you know, uh, you know professionals who can see every angle on a problem. That's so true. And I, I've seen a lot of good comments in the chat room about that, too. Um, so... And Brian's saying, yeah, cashier speed is important, but what does that mean? Um, that's a good question. But Beth had a question. I, Elizabeth, what resources will best um, will help teachers in using this process you're talking about? Um, I mean, assuming that we have a, a teacher going to this website, which is just vaporware at this point, and, and finding an interesting multimedia problem on their content standard and downloading it and, and not having a hard time loading that onto a projector. If we have all of that, the technical hurdles, which aren't high, out of the way, then I, I think it, it requires um, getting in touch with educators <laughs> who have taught using this process, who understand that it really frees you up for a lot of fun conversation where discipline problems turn into um, in instructional benefits. Um, it, it takes community. And I, I think that that's a, a really great question as I, as I consider, as I try to build this site, that the community aspect of it needs to be very, um, very intentional. Okay. And Brian wanted to know about you personally. What did it take for you to break free from traditional teaching? Uh, for me personally, it was, um, it was getting the digital projector in my classroom it was a big moment. And then I fumbled around for a couple of years with bullet points and, and, and lousy PowerPoint. And then, um, yeah, one day took out a camera and filmed some vignettes, just filmed these, these video clips and played them without any introduction or any structure built on top of them and um, had students talk about them. And that was um, 
longtime blog readers will know that's graphing stories, and that was it was downloaded six thousand times in two weeks. And I went to DC, um, you know, off of that that series, and um, kind of opened my eyes to it. Raised the bar for me. Okay, and I see that Jim. Um, hi, Jim is uh, making a, a point. Uh, he says it's great to teach thinking and um, induction, et cetera, if you're not prepping your students for uh, university math and engineering. And then we have other uh, attendees who are saying, uh, how does this hinder prepping for the university? So what do you think about that? Yeah, I can see this is a contentious one from the com comments already. And like I said before, uh, this is not uh, a total replacement for skill practice. By no means am I saying um, we just need to have interesting conversations around multimedia. That's insufficient. I'll say that right now. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that as in education as a whole, I don't think we are, are at risk of having too little skill practice. Okay. Okay. So once upon a time, you were pretty traditional in your teaching. Someone's Correct. asking, how traditional were you? <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's, it's very tough to say, of course, because we're all talking about different scales here. I mean, I, I would do, traditionally speaking, I would say I, I introduced new concepts with the words, today we're going to talk about blank. I did three mm -hmm. example problems. I mean, I explained them, I think I explained them well, the three example problems. Um, I had good report with my students. I'd assign classwork. I'd walk around and talk to them uh, about it. I wouldn't sit at a desk and read the newspaper at that point. But then I was, I, I'd assign homework, and, and, and that was it. And uh, the results spoke for themselves, both in terms of teacher satisfaction and student learning. Okay. I'm just going back through the questions. And forgive me if I'm sure. jumping all over the place, but there, there are some interesting ones. Like um, uh, one person was asking, what do you say about teaching aids like, um, I don't know how to pronounce this, Kumon, K-U-M-O-N, math, and your experience with repetition? I'm sorry. I'm unfamiliar with Kumon math. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. And I see Tony asking about the video, and I'm sorry to interrupt this. I'll say one more time. Um, I was trying to get Dan to stream video of himself, and he, like a lot of other presenters, was ought to not to. But it, it um, turns on. It looks like your own personal camera is on. You're not broadcasting. It's not doing anything. It's just a little quirk of the program, so just ignore it. No one's being filmed, so don't worry about that. I know it, it freaked me out the first time I saw it, too, So, especially since I was working at home that day. And you know how it goes. So back to the questions. Um, let, let me see. Uh, okay, that's what Tim asked before. Um, let me go back. So do you think this works better in math than in other subjects? Or do you think it's ideal for math? I think for, for STEM subjects, uh, science and math in particular, uh, these work well. Um, I, I, I've seen some interesting things in, in English language arts where you um, you put up a video prompt and talk about metaphor. You can talk about um, uh, Obviously, I'm showing my pedigree here, my mathematical pedigree. Uh, but you can just talk about, you know, um, different terms or use, using video or photos as a prompt. Uh, strikes me as being a very good use of of time in a classroom like that. Obviously, um, you know, this, my expertise here only goes so far. Okay, and then Liz is asking an interesting question. So you're teaching first year algebra. How many of these open questions might you have in five hours of class? Uh, one, if that. I mean, these are, at this point, what I love about teaching algebra the last six years is that I'm still, I'm still connecting with what I love about it. Um, it still is a story that I don't fully understand. So as I go through, uh, for example, I mean, yesterday I, I, I took $100 in pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters out of the bank in a huge sack. This is because I finally kind of got um, the coincalc.com problem. Um, for the first time, this, this strikes me as the application of the proportions has struck me. So I'm now developing um, one of these media-based math packages um, off of that problem. So, I mean, as we, as we crowdsource this, as we build a website around it, uh, I anticipate that number um, growing. And if I could address one more thing here, one more thing. Um, this, this style of teaching 
doesn't hinge on the use of multimedia. We're talking about connecting with, with what about a new concept complicates uh, the knowledge we currently have about an old concept. Uh, the idea that, that math is structured in such a way that we only learn new things because it, it, it enriches uh, old knowledge or um, it, it improves the cracks in the foundation that our old knowledge had. Instead of saying, today, this is what we're going to learn. Okay. And then Lindsay is asking, um, how do you deal with overlap? Do you try to keep your topics focused, or do you let kids explore the overlaps? She's uh, writing a book, Head First Geometry, which will be a great book, and uh, she's hitting this over and over again. Yeah, I guess I'm not sure what the, what the overlap means. Do you have a sense of that, Catherine? Or if Lindsay can clarify, that'd be great. Lindsay, you want to clarify that? I wasn't really sure either. I thought maybe... Um, it was math code that we would uh, just kind of know what we were talking about there. Oh, overlap is in mixed, uh, say, vectors and other math. I guess if you deal with one subject, it crosses over into other areas. Right. Um, I, I guess I can see how this would be frustrating from the perspective of someone developing curriculum. Um, yeah, personally, I see that overlap as being uh, a great benefit. Um, kind of the, you take calculus and it all comes together. Okay, yeah, so Bud Hunt there. Bud Hunt, one of the smart here, uh, members of the edgy bloggers here, wait. You mean content isn't truly isolated into neat and tidy silos? Oh, but. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so a couple of people are asking. Um, so, like Sarah said, that she tried a Dan-type problem. There's a new name for this. In uh, her class last year, and it was one of the best days ever. So uh, she wants you to talk about your physical peers. And someone else asked also how much of this uh, love has spread among your teaching peers. Um, how do your fellow teachers support you or imitate you? Or um, yeah, good, uh, good, painful question there. Actually, I guess um, you know, I, I, I like Sarah's comment there. I, I, I've seen a lot of that. I get emails from people who they, they just write and they just tell me how much fun it is. Kind of take these problems, just toss them out there, and have these involved conversations. Um, the fun of this is is really important in terms of the, the contagious spread of it. This is kind of inherently fun for a certain type of educator. Um, I, I work with a great department. They're they're much um, well, they're much older than I am, so their their methods are, are built a lot around traditional instruction, which they do very well. Uh, my school is um, has the highest API score of any comprehensive high school in our county, so whatever that that matters to you. But um, most of my um, my professional development with this stuff happens online, um, through my blog, through Twitter, conversations here. Okay, good. Boy, we're getting some great comments in there. And uh, Kathy Sierra posted that uh, Sci Am Mine has a great article currently on teaching science, but it applies to everything and it supports your approach in this. So that would be worth looking at. Is that online, Kathy? I'd be interested in seeing that. Ah, there we go, Scientific American. Thanks, but Snark, snarky, snarky, and resourceful, bud. <laughs> okay, so uh, one person asked a while back. Let me see. Um, that just about teaching kids math. We're uh, teaching them these concepts a lot earlier. So when should someone learn about calculus? Would that be in high school or college? Or um, I just don't know how to answer questions like "should." Uh, it strikes me as the same kind of vein as the overlap question. I mean, when a student is ready for it, they should learn calculus, which uh, to me means they need to be challenged as much as possible um, all throughout. Um, you know, the, the subjects lead up to calculus, and then, um, and then you'll know. I, I do worry about students who don't take calculus, who have disliked how math is taught, and don't really um, see the incentive. OK. All right. So um, Brian has a good question. Questioning such an important skill for qu teachers do you find yourself going through iterations of your own questioning? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this whole this presentation has, has been largely about how I've iterated my process from uh, traditional to, to uh, this more kind of constructivist space. Uh, I use the C word there. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> C words are okay. Um, and then Jim is saying, uh, again, do you have any feelings or experience with using this uh, for middle and low track students? I'm point. really glad Jim, Jim asked that. Um, the only the only courses I teach right now, the two courses are, are remedial algebra, 
And so I'm dealing with a lot of students who, for various reasons, have not succeeded in traditional classes. A lot of those have to do with low comprehension, but you know, an equal number, I would say, are there because they were they were very bored in, in their old math class and, and didn't fit into the kind of um, a lot of them didn't do homework. They didn't fit into that structure. And this this right here, uh, th those students more than others, I would say, um, are very eager for confirmation of correctness. Um, they're very eager to read the teacher's face and determine, um, oh, I got this right or I got this wrong, um, backtrack, confirm. Um, so yeah, I, I really like this for that reason and that it kind of has a rehabilitative process. Um, getting, getting these students comfortable with the process who have been very uncomfortable with the process. Wow. So what do you... Oh, that's for Jason. <laughs> Jason was asking something about different learning uh, modalities, and uh, Brian was asking, what do you mean by that? So did I hear you correctly? You're only teaching remedial um, algebra right now? Correct. I've used this in geometry and in algebra one. This is uh, remedial algebra is all I teach at the moment. That's that's amazing. I, it, I'm, you know, I'm not in the education field myself except working for a publisher. But um, it's just, I think it's, you know, inspiring to hear that there are teachers like you out there. So, so let's see, any other questions, everyone? It's, uh, okay, here's one. Um, after a year with you, do you think your students change their views on what math problems are and what math knowledge is and what constitutes an answer? Yeah, absolutely. I have no way to, I, I haven't assessed this in any kind of traditional manner. But um, I just I recognize in my students at the end of the year that they wait longer to say an answer. They are much uh, more comfortable with a wrong answer. They verbalize their process uh, more fluently. Um, I just don't know why these aren't things that we all would want in um, in our students. I'm sure we do, and um, and this is this is has been a very for me a very effective way of bringing about those changes. Okay, good. Good. And then Sarah said, based on some of the chat that was going on while you were presenting, um, can you talk about how focused you keep your conversations? And I think we've, someone asked about this before. Um, how much do you let the conversations go where the students want to take it? Uh, there's obviously kind of a, a sweet spot, a limit. You want to accommodate the Brian type students who ask all kinds of snarky questions. Um, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, if, I, if I've done my job right in, in taking these images very intentionally from a specific angle where there's very little noise, um, for example, uh, the door lock, I don't, I don't see how, there's, how we're not going to eventually come around to the question, what is the combination? Or how, many, how long would it take me to try all the combinations um, and see which one worked? If you, if you do these intentionally, um, they kind of circle around there eventually. Okay. All right, so um, I, R.O. had an interesting comment that one of his sons, who's more into art than math, took algebra and didn't do well from a traditional teacher and then retook it with the teacher who has an approach like yours, Dan, and is doing much better. I was wondering while you spoke, what happens to students that go from a class like yours in, a, into a more traditional one afterwards? Do they lose? I mean, do they retain their interest in the subject, or do they tend to challenge um, traditional teaching? What, what yeah, I, I do them? wonder. Yeah, I mean, I, I get students coming back now and then. Unfortunately, the students I see coming back during lunch times are often the ones who are, who are now frustrated with kind of their, their new math class. But uh, so I don't have a representative sample of those students. I would hope and I suspect that they bring a lot of that questioning into their new math class. And, and I worry then that that questioning is not rewarded, that kind of that kid in the back who, who pops off with some obscure exception, you know, is not challenged to expand, is not kind of validated in that, is instead, you know, uh, treated with exasperation. Interesting. Well, it would be, it would be interesting to do some research on that and see, see where it leads. Um, so, Dan. Uh, have you had students develop their own problems using multimedia for you or the class? From something you've seen, from something they've seen or wondered in the world, do they um, come up with their own ideas? Um, you know, I'll, I'll say they haven't, um, and maybe I should encourage us more. I, I get 
occasionally the response from um, particular schools of teaching, of pedagogy, um, why don't you just let the students create these? And yeah, I admit to some, some frustration there because I think that um, I, as a teacher, like I do have content area expertise. And I don't, you know, kind of hang my hat on that, but my that does give me the ability to take these questions and structure them in such a way that they challenge um, students' prior knowledge. And if a student only has that prior knowledge, it will be very difficult for them um, to create these these scenarios um, that are that are ripe with challenge. Okay, good. And earlier, uh, right on, Dan. <laughs> That's true. Earlier, um, someone was asking, oh, do you wish that math was taught like it is in the UK, where they don't split it into algebra, geometry, and calculus? They just teach math problem solving. And I think Lindsay's asking, what about the pros and cons to doing that? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. My, I'm, I'm relatively unschooled in kind of worldwide mathematical um, schools of thought, uh, of teaching. OK. All right. And then Stephen's asking again if you're supported by your peer teachers and administration. And I believe that you said somewhat. <laughs> I get kind of a mealy mouth response. Um, you know, recently, I'll just say it, like one of my teachers um, had talked badly about me to, to his, his students. Um, about my my TV appearance, which frankly I think is one of the I mean the TV appearance is one of the most ridiculous things I've been involved with, but still just the idea that this kind of exploration and and really just kind of swinging for the fences would be you know derided I, you know I just don't know what to do with that you know I kind of you know shed one small tear for the teachers for the students you know I now have in that class and um, there's you know zero chance he's listening on this but um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Okay, well, that's understandable. So, Wynn is asking a question. What about, what do, can parents do? A lot of times you don't have a choice which class your kids are in. What can parents do with their kids who are, who are in conventional math classes? Yeah, I mean, I, at the start of this, I intended to kind of preface this with, uh, you know, the various roles, the audience, you know, what they can do. Um, teachers, obviously, I think that what I'm recommending is clear. Uh, for parents, I would I would just love to have to see if I was a parent, I would have a small box that contained printouts or you know a folder on your computer that had files uh, of these kind of media based math problems and like I'll, I'll just challenge my kid and say here look what do you think about this what's the what's the combination here um, these are the things the website I'm I'm trying to build here is built around these these objects. You can hold an object in your hand and show it to a child, a student, and that student will be challenged by it, especially if we have um, different levels of scaled uh, iterations and, and difficulty. Um, I guess I would just recommend, a, a, you know, do tune in um, to these, these communities, to this website, and take what you need. Okay, and the website, one, once again, is, I want to put, put it in the chat room, what is that URL? Uh, BUSHelpful.com. BUS help. I'm sorry. Let me type that in there. Uh, okay, I'll let you. There, there is nothing there. Right oh, BUSHelpful.com. Okay, got yeah. it. Great. Thank you. Eventually. Thank yeah. you. So, and um, the ETA for that? Um, <laughs> uh, spring 2010, perhaps. Uh, it, we're working feverishly. It'll be here before you know it. So. Right. <laughs> right. Something like that's a lot of work. So um, there was another question. Um, you should have a contest to help populate that. If anybody's okay. interested who's uh, reading or listening in beta testing such a site, I would love it if you um, email my email address and express that interest if you feel some kind of kinship with this um, process. My email address is right there right now. Okay, Thanks. Yeah, it's on the screen too. And... and uh, and I, Brian's asking a question. Do you have problems with students who haven't had access to certain resources? For instance, some of your questions were about shutter speed, and they may not understand what shutter speed is, or kids who don't have Macs at home have never used iPhoto. Do you find that there's any difficulty in the references? Um, I mean, sure. I'll, I'll take a question in a slightly different direction, in that sometimes one person in the classroom will have an answer that we can all use. Um, and that's great. Ideally, I'd be a one-on-one -on -one teacher with all my kids, and I would be able to kind of talk through at their level. But um, you know, typically, 
someone will know, um, will have the prior knowledge we're looking for. Okay, great. And um, I think you already an answered this a little bit, uh, what Jim said, uh, how do your students from your classes perform in later classes? We talked about that. But do you, uh, do you work to integrate your work with the teachers who follow you? Um, yes, yeah, certainly try. There's only so much we can do, my colleagues and I, you know, in a, in a, in a day. We have an hour of collaboration time um, every week. So whatever we can accomplish there. Okay. Well, I think we're just about out of time, but um, we... oh, <laughs> this is a good question. Do you encourage kids to teach and guide each other, or does it all flow through you? Um, sure, yeah, definitely. To the extent that, that kids who are on the same level of prior knowledge can teach and guide uh, kids who are on the same level of prior knowledge, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that. But at a certain point, someone with, with greater content area expertise has to inject some sort of challenge um, into the, some sort of catalyst into that learning process, which is what I do. Great. So I just want to thank you, Dan. This has been an incredible presentation, very inspirational. I think that we all got a lot out of this. And um, I want to thank, thank everyone for joining us today and for putting up with the, the technical glitches that we had. Um, I hope you'll join us again in the future. And, um, you know, that was a one-time thing. But um, I'll send everyone a copy of the uh, a link to the recording as soon as it's available. And, um, just, Dan, I just want to say thank you. This is great. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay. I'm going to close the window out now. If you want a copy of the chat transcript, um, you'll need to copy it and paste it into a, a text file. I'm doing that. I don't know if anyone wants it, but if you can, you, if you do, you can email me at webcast at and I'll be glad to send it to you. So I'm closing out the meeting now. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.